So we finished off uh, uh, last hour talking a little bit about services, applications, and architectures. So services uh, will come a little bit more clear what that means uh, later, but applications we're pretty familiar with. So uh, common uh, uh, applications and services then. Uh, well, a typical thing we have is that we have two parties that would like to communicate, Alice and Bob. And they use a network to communicate. And they can communicate in different, with different types of applications, email, telephone, web browsing, short texts, and so forth. Okay. So the network itself, what is it? Well, typically it's this, I mean, pictorial is this, this, this cloud, right? But what's inside the cloud? Well, it's full of things. But the idea is that these things are typically hidden to the, to the user of it. So the user doesn't know about exactly what's inside the network and frankly doesn't really care as long as uh, the user gets the service he or she requested. So inside here we have all kinds of different boxes. There are routers, servers, switchers, multiplexers, hubs, modems, and the list goes on forever. Um, and there are cables, optical fibers, wireless links interconnecting these boxes, right? Uh, and on top of that, everything is somehow placed in, in maybe in particular buildings or pieces of buildings, a cabinet inside a building. We also have, you know, like uh, big uh, masts where you put radio equipment in and so forth. So, but the thing is that this is normally hidden to the user and it's also something that the user should not need to care about. The user should be able to attach to the network and use the network without bothering about whether this link here is a fiber optical link or, or a wireless link. It should work anyways. <coughs> okay. So two types of networks uh, here, a little bit of extreme. So suppose we have n nodes. So n in this case is equal to 5. We have five nodes, uh, the green nodes uh, here, the, the, the green ones, and they should be interconnected. So each node should be able to communicate with another. So what can we do then in order to do that? Well, there are two extreme topologies here in how to do this interconnection. So if we look at the mesh network here to the left, uh, here each node has a dedicated line to each other node. right? That's one way to connect all nodes. So when we add a new node to this network, we draw lines to all uh, earlier existing nodes. A star network is something where each, uh, where we have a special node in the middle, which is not an end node. So this one is particular to the network. It's a network node which does not have a user attached to it but it's only there to facilitate communications between the users. So the users are at the green nodes here. So one way to do this is to, uh, whenever we have a node, we draw a line towards this middle node, and then through the middle node, we can reach all other nodes. So if we want to add a node to this network, we simply add it and then draw a line to that, uh, to the middle node. Okay, so communication, for instance, between this node and this node goes directly in uh, when we have a mesh network. It goes directly over the dedicated line. It could, of course, go over some other network uh, node. That's a possibility. But for sure, it can go the, the, the direct way here, which typically is preferable because of, of delay and also uh, uh, other, other reasons. Now, in the star network, if uh, this node wants to communicate to any other node, it first needs to communicate the information down to the center of the network, and then the network needs to figure out where it should go. And in this case, it should go, um, uh, oops, uh, to, um, let's do this once more. Uh, it should go down to this one. So here we see that uh, the communication is two hop. We go from this node to the center node and then out here. Okay, so 
which one should we choose? Well, it depends a little bit. And one way to, uh, it depends is that many things depends on is cost. So which one of these two networks is the most costly one? The mesh, right? Uh, it stands to reason that the mesh network here is the most costly one. And one way to count cost is to count the number of links which are involved in this. So if we have n links here, how many, how many uh, links does the network need to have? Well, it's actually uh, n times n minus 1 divided by 2, or n squared links. Okay. Uh, and it's not so hard to understand that this is true, that for if we take one particular node here and count the number of links that goes out from that node, it is 1, 2, 3, 4, which is n minus 1. So for each new node, we need n minus 1 links. And we count all of them, we get n times n minus 1. But then we have counted some link, all links twice. We need to divide by 2, and therefore we get this formula. But anyways. N squared is the, the, the how this scales with the number of network nodes. However, if we do the star network, it's simple. We just need N links here. So it's the cheapest we can hope for, actually. Uh, so which one is used in practice? Star? Yeah. Both? It's a, it's a mix, of course. Uh, so star networks are quite common uh, for local area networks, where you have your router and then network cables coming out of, the net, uh, of that router. Then the router is the central point, and all the attached uh, um, nodes or computers to that forms a star. But then from the router, it goes down to your ISP and, and further on into the internet. And that could be a much more complicated network. May never really a full mesh, but there could be a full mesh uh, with a, a few nodes into it because it's so expensive. But it could be a ring or it could be some other topology. OK. Um, so one advantage of this uh, I mean, it's expensive. Mesh networks are expensive. But one thing is very good, it's a robust. Okay. So what do we mean by robustness? Well, it means that if, if we cut off one of these cables because there is an uh, excavator, uh, uh, you know, grab uh, machine, okay? excavator uh, pulling off the fiber optical cables. Okay. That happens on a regular basis. So what do we do? Well, we lose communication that way, but we can still communicate between this point and this point by routing the information over some other point. Okay, so it's quite robust, this one. While in this case, when we have um, a star, if this link is uh, cut in half, then this poor node has no communication to any node. So it's quite unrobust in that sense. So depending on your needs, uh, you go for, for a mesh or a star or something in between. OK. Um, so let's talk about uh, message switching networks. And, and we'll do this in, in terms of a, an example to figure out the main characteristics of this. So uh, a telegraph network, uh, they're not very common nowadays, but they, they used to be the dominant uh, way of communicating over long distance. So a telegraph network is based on what? It's based on that we transmit messages, telegrams. And these telegrams have three parts. There is a receiver address, a sender address, and a user message. So when Alice wants to send to Bob a message, congratulations on your birthday, then Alice puts Bob's address here, and then her own address here, so Bob knows where this comes from, and then the message. Okay. So the telegram has some user, useful information, which is the message, and some control information needed in order for this uh, message to reach its destination. In this case, the receiver address and sender address. Then this uh, data, the addresses and the user messages are then transmitted over a telegraph uh, line. 
And uh, that's digital transmission, actually. So the telegraph network is an early example of digital transmission. And you use Morse code, uh, the early ones, which is these dashes and dots, right? If you ever heard of uh, this uh, signaling uh, scheme, you know this. So each letter is then translated into a sequence of dashes and dots and keyed out on the line and then decoded at the other end. So it's uh, transmitted, this message is then transmitted from a transmitter into the network to a receiving station that might not be the end station where Bob is actually uh, living, but it could be some intermediate node. But at that receiving station, we do message switching. Okay, so what is that? Well, the first thing to do is that the receiver receives and stores the telegram. So the receiver person or machine is decoding the Morse code into the entire receiver address, sender address, and user message. Okay, so it's the text. And then one ins inspects that message, in particular one inspects the receiver address, to figure out where it should go. Okay, should it go to a person that lives uh, next door to this station, or do it need to go to the next station in the telegraph network? So one determines the next hop, uh, which is um, or another way to say it, one, one look in the router table to figure out where this should go next. And then one forward that to the next station. Okay, so in each network node in a telegraph system, one receives the entire message, looks at the message, and figure out what to do with it. If it should be uh, sent out to a person next to the station, or if it should send, be sent further along to another station. So this is called uh, message switching uh, according to the store and forward uh, paradigm that we, we receive, we store, inspect, and then forward it to the next station. Okay, uh, messages, uh, multiple messages are multiplied over these transmission lines, so we can transmit several messages with different destinations uh, after each other on these transmission lines. And then we need something called framing, and that will be clearer when I do the example in, in a second here. Okay, so any questions? No? Okay, so now I will do this. Mm. And <coughs> we'll go over here. Okay, so hopefully we can, uh, instead of a drawing on a whiteboard, it's going to be drawing like this. So this is, um, I think, uh, something that you learn how to do with practice. So let's see how this works. But um, uh, suppose we want to do an example here of a telegram. So a telegram consists of three parts. It is the destination. It is the, the source address, and then there is this message. So, for instance, the destination could be Bob. Okay. Which Bob? Well, the Bob that lives in Borlänge. And now we just pretend that there is just a single Bob in Borlänge. Otherwise, maybe one has to specify the address and so forth. Okay. But there is some type of address like this. And you see this is a hierarchical, uh, hierarchical address in set that we specify that it should go to Borlänge. And once you are in Borlänge, you should route that to Bob. So this is very useful when doing the forwarding internal network because you don't need to know where every single person on this earth is living, because you can just look at Borlänge and send it to Borlänge, and the people in Borlänge has to deal with it. Right? And the source is here from Alice, and she lives in Aling source. Okay, and then the me message is like, uh, congrats, like this, Excl exclamation point. Okay, so we have three, three fields here. Uh, we have the destination, the source, and the message. And uh, in, in this case, we have um, uh, a hierarchy of um, uh, um, 
in the address. We have Borlänge, which is the bigger context, and then Bob in Borlänge. Okay, um, so let's see how this uh, should be routed then. Um, so suppose Alice is here, and we have Bob on the other side. Okay, and the message should be then going like this. This is the message. Okay, so this is the virtual path between users of the network, Alice and Bob. But uh, Alice lives in Allingsås and Bob lives in Borlänge, so it's quite far between these two places. So uh, in Allingsås, there is a telegraph station like this. So it's a house of some, some sort. And uh, this telegraph station is connected then through other stations, uh, one in Avesta here. Another station. One in Skövde. I have no idea if this is uh, really the topology, but, you know, let's pretend. And then we have Borlänge here. Okay, so here we have four telegraph stations and they are interconnected. They don't use a full mesh because it's too expensive. So it's uh, maybe Allingsås is connected to Avesta and Skövde. Skövde is connected to Allingsås and also to Avesta and then to Borlänge and potentially to some other places. And Avesta also ha happens to have a, a direct line to Borlänge. Okay, so then uh, Alice then formulates her message, she knows her message, which is this um, uh, congratulations here. So that's your message, M, let's call it. And then she puts on the addresses which are needed, her own address, which is the source address, Alice, in Allingsås, and then the destination address, D, which is Bob in Borlänge. And uh, then uh, all of this, makes up the telegram from Alice to Bob, okay? And then Alice takes this to the, the friendly people at the telegraph station in Allingsås and hand that over to them and pay the fee. And the people in Allingsås that say, okay, so this should go then, looks at the destination address, D, and says, okay, this should go to Bob, and then say, okay, the best way to Borlänge is actually over Skövde. So then the message is sent to Skövde. In Skövde, they decode the message, look at this, okay, so it seems to be from somebody called Alice, it's headed toward Bob, okay, and okay, we have a direct connection to, uh, to Borlänge, sorry, it's headed to Borlänge, okay, so then they send it to Borlänge. And then the people in Borlänge look at the, at the message and say, okay, so this is actually to Borlänge, who in Borlänge should this go to? And then they see, okay, it should go to Bob. And then they send out uh, some uh, student or whatever to uh, hand over the message to Bob, like this. Okay, so this is message switching, where at each, um, let's see. Where at each place, the message is uh, received, it's checked for uh, uh, its destination address and then routed towards uh, in the general direction of the, of the recipient. Okay. Now, uh, in, in, in Allingsås, there is another person also, Alma, who also wants to send a message. Uh, so she is sending it to some person, D prime, uh, and she's Alma, so the source is Alma, not Alice. And then there is some message, uh, M prime, some other message. I'm sorry your dog died or something, right? And this is uh, Alma's message, right? And she's also using uh, the network here. And let's draw this in red. So she goes to the, the, the same station as Alice, 
and ask for this to be transmitted. And suppose this is going to Avesta. Uh, then this telegram is also sent over this route because of some reason the, the line to Avesta from Allingsås was very busy. So they decided to send it over Skövde instead. And then it's forward to Skövde and then out to the destination in Skövde. Uh, sorry, in Avesta. But anyways, we see here now that during this transmission, there are two messages sent over the same line. Okay, so this is called multiplexing. That is, we use the, 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 the network to transmit multiple messages at the same time. Multiplexing. And if we look at in time, how this would look like, so if suppose we have a time axis here. It's not very straight, but here we go. Okay, and then we have two messages going over this line. Uh, now they are, let's assume that you can only use one message at a time, so they are following consecutively each other. So we have uh, the message first from uh, Alice, so DS and then M. Okay, so this is the message transmitted during this time by Alice to Bob. And then we have the message from uh, Alma. D oops, sorry. Uh, let's it's uh, D prime, S prime, M prime, okay. Which is transmitted uh, a little bit earlier, actually. Now, one has to insert a gap between these messages in order for people in Skövde to figure out that these are actually two messages and not uh, a single one. And in particular, one typically inserts a very special sequence here saying that this is a delimiter between two consecutive messages. Okay. So this one is called a frame delimiter. A special sequence that could not be part of a destination address or a message. Okay. So any questions so far? Okay. So this is roughly how computer networks works today. Uh, the same ideas that we, we transmit packets of data and packets are routed towards their destination by internal nodes in the, in the routers inside the network. Okay. And uh, also these routes are dynamic in the, t in the sense that they are not predetermined. They could change over time. And in particular, they're not known at the time when Alice hands in this to Aling Source, the people in Aling Source, they don't know which, exactly which path it will take through the network towards its destination. Okay. Uh, let's see, we should do this. Okay. Okay. Um, let's take another historical network and contrast that to message switching. And that is when we have something called a circuit switching network. And an example of that is a, uh, like a telephone network. And now we're talking about the old school telephone network, not mobile network, uh, mobile telephones. And in the old days, this was based on, on what's known as circuit switching. Okay. So let's explain what the difference in is between message switching and circuit switching. So if you ever done this, um, how to place a telephone call on the old style telephone network, you have a transceiver, uh, uh, like a telephone, right? Uh, something which has a, a cord into the ball and it has a hook, a receiver on it that you lift up, right? So the first thing to do is that you pick up the, the, record, um, the receiver, this lur in Swedish, right? And then you get a dial tone, right? And because when you pick this up, the telephone network is alerted that you would like to use its services. And then the telephone network says, OK, I'm happy to, uh, to serve you and give you a dial tone to say, OK, I'm, I'm here. What do you want? And the second thing you do when you hear, hear a dial tone is, to, of course, to dial the number. And then the network selects a route 
through the network that connects your telephone with the, uh, the other end's telephone and then call the receiving party, essentially but sending a, a call tone to that receiver. And then the telephone at the other end uh, rings and then the receiving party then picks up the receiver at that end. Okay. So A to B, D here is done before any information is actually sent, any message is sent over the network. But then information transfer takes place over this connection. The two people talk, blah, 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 until they're done. And then they release the connection, typically by saying goodbye, bye-bye, and then hang up the telephones. Or if it wasn't very pleasant, they just hang up, right? These are two works the same way for the network point of view. And then the network sees, okay, somebody hung up, so we can then release the connection here that was placed between uh, the two uh, end nodes. Okay. So this is quite different from what we talked before. And the difference is that before any information is transmitted, we do this connection setup. <coughs> So, uh, just to illustrate this a little bit. So, uh, suppose we have here sti still Alice and Bob, and they want to communicate. We have Alice here, and we have Bob. Okay. And Alice has this one, you know, old style type of telephone, like this, with uh, a lure receiver on it. And this one has a cord that goes into the wall and eventually goes to a telephone station. Let's call it uh, a telephone switch. And we call this telephone switch A. And it looks something like this. So the switch A has many incoming lines here from different types of uh, telephones from different uh, persons. Inside the switch here, very simplified of course, uh, we have some incoming lines and then we have some outgoing lines. Like this. And these are interconnected with the switch. So we have some type of switch here, which has two moving parts that could connect different incoming lines with different outcoming lines. Okay. So this is uh, one switch and then there are several switches on the way to Bob. Let's just draw in two of them. So we have here switch B. Which is exactly the same as a number of incoming lines. And a number of outgoing lines and some uh, moving parts here that could, oops, that was really badly drawn. That could move back and forth here to connect different incomings and outcoming lines. And one of these outgoing lines is then connected to Bob's telephone. Like this. Okay. So now here's the topology. And what happens here then is that we have three phases basically. We have the setup phase. Essentially where Alice is uh, taking off her hook, dialing the number, the network is setting up a connection, calling Bob and Bob lifts the receiver. Okay, That's the setup phase. And then we have the talk phase talk phase where they talk and then there is the uh, hang up phase where basically uh, the circuit is released. Okay, so how is this working in the setup phase now? Well, the first thing to do is that Alice's pick up her hook uh, or uh, her takes up uh, um, the, her uh, receiver, sorry, okay. 
So this is one A pickup, say. And then uh, she hear, hear, she hears the dial tone, and then she dials. Or okay, one B uh, generate dial tone. Okay, she lifts the receiver, and then the network uh, sees this, and then generate the dial tone, and then Alice knows. Okay, now I can uh, dial, and then uh, Alice is dial. 1C here, and she dies 1, 0, 2, 3, 4, I don't know, uh, 1, 7, 1, 8, uh, 1, 9, say. Okay. Now, the old style telephone network was also built on addresses. So this is the destination address, right? And it's also hierarchical in the sense we have an area code in the beginning, and then a um, not area code at the end. I can't recall what the name of it is. Uh, like in Swedish, riktnummer och sen så telefonnummer. So the area code and then the actual telephone number. So the switch A here needs figure out. Okay, so it needs to go to some destination given by the area code, and then the switch knows essentially in which di general direction to do this. Okay. But anyways, by dialing here, uh, the network is then positioning <coughs> this moving part to connect uh, the incoming call from Alice to a out, uh, output port to the next switch that looks at this uh, uh, address and then places the moving parts to connect to Bob. So the network uh, sets up the 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 um, circuit okay so the circuit uh, think of this as electrical circuits right so we 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 have like now a galvanic connection between these two devices, the one to the left and one to the right, in this green line. Okay. This is actually what was done in the past. Okay, and then uh, uh, dial uh, ringtone is generated. Which alerts Bob that somebody is calling him, and Bob takes off the hook. Okay, so this is the setup phase. Okay, so nothing of consequence has been transmitted, uh, I mean, user information through the network now. There's been a lot of, of signaling between the different switches and so forth to figure out where to make the connection. But once the connection is done, then we go to the talk phase, talk, 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 and when we're done, the one of these or both of these are, are uh, receivers are put down on the telephone, and then the switches are releasing this green connection. But the green connection is there for the entirety of the call. Okay, so this is called circuit switching. Questions? Yes. Okay, so very good question. So suppose now that all of these uh, users at the same time lifts the hook, right? And then you get some of them will be blocked. Okay. So when you do circuit switching like this, there is only a finite number of circuits that you can have active, which means that there is a maximum number of users that you can support at any given point in time. So that's one of the weaknesses of a circuit switching network. One advantage of the circuit switching network is that once you have a circuit, it's there for you to use. You have guarantee service, you know, assuming that there is not a thunderstorm or something like that. But anyways, if nothing unexpected happens, then you will have this service. So if one do the opposite, if we look at the message switching network, you're not guarantee service. 
just because you were able to send a little bit of information, the next piece of information is not necessarily sent because there might be congestion in the network or something like that. So circuit switching your, your, your service is typically unaffected by other users' uh, requirements or, or demands, while in message switching that is not the case. Right. So we know sometimes internet is slow. Right. Sometimes fast, sometimes slow. Okay. Telephone network, either it works or it doesn't. Right. It's more on off. Okay, very good question. Thank you. Uh, Okay, so um, now to uh, reduce the stress of or the monotony of only looking at slides, um, I have a little quiz for you guys. So uh, it's not going to be graded, by the way, but um, if I ask you this, and this could be potentially a potential quiz question for next week, it's not going to be like that, but anyways, it could be of that nature. So what is true for the telegraph system? And then I will give you a number of five possible answers. Now it's only binary here. Uh, so um, is this true that uh, before the telegram is sent that the route, uh, is it true that before it's sent that the route from the end station is determined? So how many for yes? How many for no? Excellent. You're all perfectly aware of this, right? So for the telegram system, uh, you just send the telegram, and you just send it forward, right? Without knowing if there, uh, there will be an eventual receiver there or not. Maybe that uh, been an earthquake or something like that, so it doesn't exist anymore. You don't know. Okay, telephone system then. Before the caller starts to uh, start talking, the route from the end station is determined. Yes or no? Yes? No? This was too simple, right? So here is the true, this is true, uh, that the, the route is actually set up, right? Okay, consider a system with N, uh, uh, capital N, N station that wants to communicate. Which network topology is the most economical one? Mesh or star? So mesh, star, A. <laughs> okay. So maybe this was a little bit too simple questions, but you get the, the flavor, right? So I will ask these type of questions, and if you were unable to answer these, that should be a warning uh, signal for you, right? Okay. So um, computer networks, what are those uh, modern computer networks? Well, basically, um, to do that, we, need, we, we have a bunch of protocols, and we have a bunch of these uh, um, network uh, nodes like routers, switches, and so forth. And so what is a protocol? Well, a protocol, and we will talk much more about this, but just to give you a flavor of what it is, you might even know what it is already. It's a set of rules that governs how two or more communicating parties should interact. Okay? So basically, it could be the two end nodes, what language they speak, or it could be the number of intermediate nodes in the network, how they, uh, how they talk to each other, right? What are the uh, required, what is possible uh, in this interaction? And a number of protocols that you are probably familiar with, the uh, internet protocol, IP, uh, TCP, transmission control protocol, uh, HTTP, hypertext transport uh, transfer uh, protocol, S SMTP, uh, mail protocol. You, you, of course, you used all of them already, right? Uh, and there is uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of different protocols, big and small, right? But these, I, I'm pretty sure you heard of before. Now, communication between connected computers is done by exchanging packets, okay? And packets are 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 uh, a number of bits that is considered one unit. Uh, some special names for these packets could be messages, it could be frames, there could be segments. There are different names for this, but if we just say packets in general, we mean a bunch of bits that somehow belong to, to each other. So think of the telegram as one packet, okay? 
it's one unit. It cannot be split up. Uh, uh, well, more about that later, actually. It could be split up. And, but anyways, it's a unit, right? And typically it consists of a header, which is some information needed for the data to reach its destination. And then it could be the data proper. Okay. So the data is the message that needs to be sent. It's some bits. And then before that, we send some information about how these, where these bits should go. So think of them as addresses, the destination and source addresses, and the data as the, the message right in the telegram. So headers typically contains address and other control information. And this distinction that we different, differentiate between data and control information in headers is an important one. So basically, the system should be, uh, the network should look at the headers and to do its work. It should never look at the data in order to figure out what to do. Right. So that's the principle. So it's like in, in if you send a, a regular uh, post, you have a, an envelope, you write your message on a piece of paper, you put it in an envelope, and then you glue the envelope to shut, right? And then the, the post office should never op need to open your, your, your uh, envelope, right? It should never look at the data that you transmit because all the post office needs are the addresses which are printed on the, on the envelope. Okay? And the same principle here is also in, in computer networks. Packet switching is, is the typical way things are used, but circuit switching are also used, actually. Uh, to transmit in uh, packets in computer networks. So packets are transmitted from one end node to the other one without reserving a circuit. Okay, so we just push the information into the network and hope that it uh, uh, makes its way through to the other end. And it's uh, made its way towards the uh, receiving end node by packet switches. These are the routers that are inside the network whose job it is to forward messages in the general right direction. Now, if the message is very long, so suppose you want to download a, uh, like your, a movie or something like that, it could be several gigabytes, you don't transmit that as one packet. It's split up in smaller packets for efficiency and robustness uh, uh, purposes. So long messages can be split up into smaller messages, and this is called segmentation. Short messages, on the other hand, could be aggregated into a larger packet for efficiency. So, for instance, if I have a bunch of, of, of uh, say, uh, lamp switches that are on or off, and I would like to know the status of all the, 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 the lamp switches in this building, I can transmit one packet per, per, per uh, uh, switch, or I can aggregate everything into one packet and transmit that. So it's typically, there is a sweet spot. You don't want to transmit too long messages, but not too short messages for efficiency purposes. So this is called aggregation. Now, uh, as was touched on earlier, what could go wrong in a network like this? Well, it could go wrong if we push in too much packets into the network. Then we can get congestion. Okay? So congestion control is needed to avoid buffer overflows inside the network. So for instance, if everybody in this room takes up their laptops and starts to download uh, a, a file from Netflix or something like that, then for sure we're going to overload the, the, the network. And the network takes then defensive me measures against this by basically throttling our data rates. So we are not killing the, the, the network by requesting a lot of, or transmitting a lot of data. Okay. So this is needed. This is uh, <coughs> prevention for network failure. And this is uh, called congestion control. And we will talk briefly about how to do that in, in a practical setting. Flow control is another way of congestion control, one would say. And this is to uh, not overwhelm a receiver. So for instance, if I have a device which is not very capable and I want to download a web page, the web server is probably much more powerful than my handheld device and maybe there is a finite amount of memory and processing power in this. I don't want uh, two gigabyte uh, uh, data just boom down into this device. 
because then it will crash, right? So uh, uh, flow control is to tell to tell the, the web server to you know please send me this but not too fast, right? Okay, so the flow control is also needed. Maybe it goes very quickly through. The, there is no problem with the network. There is no congestion in the network, but we will kill the end device on the other side, which is not so good. Okay, so flow control is also needed. Um, something which is also needed is that we share the same physical medium between different packets. So we need a mechanism called medium access control to have rules for how we share the same, say, radio channel or the same Ethernet cable or something like that, right? When we have different packets or different flows of packets contending for this medium. So this is called medium access control. We'll talk more about that later in the course. And then something that always happens is there will be errors. Okay, uh, no machine is perfect, so there will be errors, and we need to deal with them somehow. So there will be a, a need for error control. Okay, and we will talk about all of these things as we go along in the course. Routing and forwarding is also a, a um, uh, basic element in these uh, networks, and. So what is that? If, if we go back to the telegraph uh, system, it's the same uh, essential idea here. Um, so since we're running out of time, I will just leave this. You just read it. But basically, what we do at each network uh, node, we receive the packet, we we'll inspect the addresses and figure out where to send it. Store and forward. OK, and that's it for today. Let's skip the quiz also. You can do it at home. I'm sure you will ace it like you did the first one. So we'll meet each other. Uh, so this week is special. Ah, by the way, I didn't tell you that. Uh, the, 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 the schedule is a little bit time varying. So there will be a lot of lectures in the beginning, a few exercises, a little bit more exercises later on, back and forth, right? So look at time edit, and then you get the complete um, schedule. So unfortunately on Thursday, uh, unfortunately for me at least, uh, I need to be awake and in the room at 8 o'clock. And I hope to see many of you then. And then we will have a nice lecture followed by a break and another nice lecture. So it's going to be four hours of two t four times 45 minutes of lecturing on Thursday morning. And then we're ready for lunch. And then there will be one on Friday also. So it's going to be a quick start to the course. But see you on Thursday, hopefully.